Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Financially Irresponsible. I'm your host, Rakim Sabri, and true to my commitment, I have been getting guests to come on from the community doing great work. Today's episode, I want to introduce you guys to Kevin Pollan. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Tell the audience a little bit about who you are, what you do, and uh, we'll kick it from there. All right. Um, so... I am the executive, <clears throat> pardon me, I am the executive director and co-founder of a nonprofit called Winning Ways. Uh, Winning Ways is based out of uh, Brantford, Connecticut, and we're a statewide nonprofit, and what we do is work with individuals that have experienced reentry, um, as well as recovery. We also work with at-risk youth and uh, victims of domestic violence. And essentially, Winning Ways is a support system for those that don't have it. And our job is to navigate and provide skills that individuals can use to increase the quality of their life. Fantastic. And Kevin and I met, um, I was a guest on his podcast yeah. discussing uh, financial trauma and some of the work that I was doing around financial education. Right. And um, Kevin, tell the audience a little bit about um, what Winning Ways involvement in the area of financial education specifically looks like, mm -hmm. and um, what what has that journey looked like for you um, in you know being a founder? Okay, so with financial education, we created a uh, a robust curriculum that's called the Winning Circle series, and um, when we first started Winning Ways, uh, we were young and naive, and uh, we wanted to have a residential program where individuals returning home from incarceration can spend nine months without worrying about rent, without worrying about um, just getting right out there, really just work on themselves or underlying the issues and save. Um, during that journey, there was a lot of roadblocks and just being new kids on the block, uh, no pun intended, that, that created us to be innovative and take pieces out of our curriculum that people in the industry weren't doing. And that's when we came with financial literacy. Many, if not uh, I won't say all, but the majority of nonprofits working in human services uh, do financial literacy, but it's not a uh, a requirement like other programs are. So what we started to do was partner with other uh, par uh, organizations, first in New Haven, then throughout the state that do that doesn't do financial literacy to supplement and complement the programs they have. Um, through through what we created with financial literacy. We really hang our hats on uh, lived experience as well as education and creating a family instilled program. So what we end up doing is going inside, meeting people where they're at, whether that's prison, halfway houses, rehab centers, schools, uh, you name it. We'll go we'll go there to facilitate the class. And in that time, in that time, we reflect on lived experience to create this not only create uh, an environment where people relate to each other, but then to make sure that that empathy is there because individuals are experiencing financial trauma, right? And when experiencing financial trauma, many people close, close off and they don't want to talk about that. So when you have someone that can say, hey, I've been through that too, that creates that safe space. So we hang our hats on that. And what we do with our financial literacy class, we just create a situation where we go on over the basics, right? Um, budgeting, credit, um, life insurance, you name it, just to touch on different topics. And then we create a platform where we do follow-ups for six months with anyone that's been through our course, just so, again, we could be that support system. Because a lot of people, they could take a course for, for a few days and then that facilitator or that organization then moves on and now they have a question and that, that support's not there. So um, we do five sessions um, and then we do the six-month follow-up. During the five sessions, we uh, bring in partners, uh, uh, local banks, which include M&T Bank, Key Bank, Thomaston Bank, uh, to name a few, that will actually come in and facilitate their own program for that one class. And not only are they sharing um, their curriculum when it comes to financial literacy, 
we're we're creating a space where people could now trust banking because historically, oh, yeah. um, you know, black and brown communities have reasons not to trust banking. So we look to break those stigmas and create relationships, organic relationships with local banks and the community. So um, in in closing, our goal is to set up a foundation where financial trauma can be addressed um, and you could take the first steps to go towards healing and essentially uh, lower recidivism, lower relapse, and just, again, have a quality of life that someone could be proud of and hang their hat on that and not have to continue to go through the shame of financial trauma or the guilt of financial trauma. Just letting people know that, you know, there's so many different obstacles, oppressions has been set forth for black and brown. And because of that, it's okay that you made some mistakes. You're actually, we're put in a situation where those mistakes were supposed to happen. So now that you know where these potholes at, where our job is to point those out and give you that navigation so you can now increase your quality of life. Yeah, man. like I'm, I'm lighting up on the inside with so many things that you've said um, because there are things that I've said on the show, right? <laughs> I think, you know, just to kind of start off with the, I, I've, kind of dubbed it the willful non-participation in financial systems that black and brown mm -hmm. people have um I gotta write that and down. participate yeah participate in, or refuse to participate in rather because of some of the historic institutional abuses that right. and let me rephrase historic and present day institutional abuses yes that um yes. that we navigate um I thought that it was interesting the demographic that you serve um because one of my goals in in kind of running this show is to talk about how financial literacy doesn't look the same for everybody, mm -hmm. right? There, it's, it's, it's often, at least in the past, it has been often packaged as looking one way. And so we're talking about the same topics over and over, and it's delivered in a very similar way from a very similar kind of archetype. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about the audiences that you serve, um, in particular, the experiences of guilt or shame, um, I find that some financial educators tend to steer away from that demographic because, for one, they're, they can't connect on the basis of a shared experience. Mm -hmm. um, but for two, they may feel intimidated in bringing in you know, this education to that environment because of some of the pushback that they might experience. And in some of the work that I've done um, in this area, specifically, um, I've received some of that pushback, right? Like it, I've worked in um, with a group of formerly incarcerated men and they're like, well, I can't do what you can do because I can't get the jobs that you can get. Or So there, there's a lot of conversations around um, how do we navigate non-traditional means of participating in this very traditional system. And so I, I think that's super important, the work that you do um, to that end as well. Tell me about the evolution of the uh, the organization, right? So you said when you started, you were like the new kids on the block, very ambitious. And I can relate to that um, just in terms of you know wanting to save the world, right? You come out, you have this idea, and then you realize through kind of like a lot of the red tape and the bureaucracy that, you know, maybe I need to kind of niche down a little bit. What has that journey looked like? And you, you kind of alluded to pulling some things out of your program, um, expanding the program. What has that evolution looked like? It's a great question. Um, started back in 2016 is when we started, the summer of 2016. Um, and myself, I'm one of three co-founders. Shout outs to Ben Backus and Andrew Redenti. Those are my brothers. And I met Ben um, working at a local shelter in New Haven. And during that time, <clears throat> we we both agreed that the bar of success coming out of a shelter was low. Um, and what I mean by that is if you got housing and or employment, it was a success. But that doesn't create a space where you're addressing the underlying issues and creating retention of a job or retention of housing. And then people are coming right back to the shelter and it's the same faces. So what we wanted to do was create a space where we could set the bar higher and address underlying issues. So 
as we navigated in our first few years, no money, no grants, no funding, no anything. We did everything out of pocket for out of eight years, at least five were maybe even six were out of pocket. Right. And during that time, as I look back, that was actually a blessing because we didn't receive any funding where a funder could tell us what we have to do or how we have to do it. So we were able to be real innovative and create our own goals and actually push the goals because we wanted to be set it higher. So at, w while doing so, um, there was a lot of, as you said, red tape in terms of they just didn't. We were we were out of the norm yeah. when it came to financial literacy and people that don't have the experience and a lot of these organizations but are the ones calling the shots didn't see the value of financial literacy. So the evolution of, of financial literacy with winning ways was really first showing the importance of financial literacy to not just, as you said, the pushback of the participants, but the people that are running the organizations. They're, um, they're literally saying, um, why are we doing financial literacy when they don't have any money? And terrible, <laughs> horrible. And I mean, it, 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 I mean, people that that are that are known in the state, people at bigger organizations, people that are shot callers are saying this in meetings to me um, with no filter. Like it's just they just don't get it. And so our job was to to with the evolution was to show the importance of it, to show that if we're not addressing this financial trauma, then these numbers are going to stay the same when it comes to recidivism, when it comes to relapse and all that. Uh, repeat behavior. And one of the things that I realized, and um, I try not to hold, I try to, to stay a little more positive, but this is probably the one thing that, that I have a negative outlook on, is that the system is created to see relapse, to see recidivism, right? So we had to really evolve into advoc advocacy and not just going to the capital, but just advocacy in our own neighborhoods to say, hey, if the participants or the community doesn't see the importance, then the people that are calling the shots are not going to see the importance. So it was really gathering our peers, gathering colleagues, gathering people that we work with, um, smaller organizations to have them advocate on the importance of financial literacy. And by doing so, forcing the hand of the powers that be to start right. implementing financial literacy. So during our journey, it was just being an advocate and, and not having the pressure of having to change or having to, you know, take funding that would that would create an environment where we have to do what the funders say rather than what our core mission is. So now that we're getting funding from different sources, we still hold to that. Like we're not taking the money if we can't do it our way. You know what I mean? And the results show, you know, we've we've helped a lot of people, um, success stories, um, you know, um, surveys say everything goes great. And and that's really the evolution. Now that we're at this point, um, we're doing more one-on-one uh, -on -one programming. So currently there's gonna be a press conference at the end of April where we're gonna be at the New Haven Green with the city of New Haven, uh, Yale School of Psychiatry and Connecticut Association of Human Services where we're gonna facilitate a pilot program where we're doing financial counseling with people returning home from incarceration. So that's a huge evolution for us because now we're having like big boy partners and we're at the table now. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, that's just going back to all the advocacy, all the work that we've been doing, people like you that's been pushing the narrative of financial, um, not just literacy, but financial trauma. I think that's even, that's really the term that, that's being, that's being uh, showcased this last few years. And people now are seeing like, hey, we got to get with this because at, at some point, you can't deny that this is happening and you can't deny that people need to heal from it. And there's organizations like ourselves and many others and people like yourself that's doing the work. And all we want is just a fair uh, ground to make impact on our people. Yeah. So we're just able to just do more, get more resources and leverage those resources to continue to make impact. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that um, it, it's so funny with kind of the current climate in the world of financial education because there is certainly kind of like this wider spread acceptance mm -hmm. um, on the part of practitioners 
up from you know the highest levels of academia all the way down to the the you know one on one client serving individual. And um, across the industry, I'm seeing like the CFP board is requiring you know uh, financial psychology and kind of this behavioral finance. Um, components of the education with CFPs, which, you know, they're kind of like regarded as that gold standard, right, in financial right. planning. Right. Uh, I'm seeing with a lot of um, academics who are in the world of financial therapy being amplified through publications and television and um, other forms of media, I'm seeing more of these conversations, right, where the, the term or the phrase financial trauma is being kind of tossed around. And there are a lot of people asking, like, well, what, you know, what is financial trauma? Like, what does that mean? And so there are a lot of different definitions. And when I first started using the term, I want to say it was three years ago. I, first of all, didn't know it already existed. I thought, like, I'm, just, oh, I'm, I'm being clever and I'm combining these two things. Mm -hmm. But it really speaks to uh, what you talked about early on, right? The acknowledgement of, particularly for uh, black and brown Americans, that there have been systemic obstacles to what success looks like. Um, and, you know, you said it, and I'm, I'm going to double down on it, almost looks like it was designed in a way that, you know, you're supposed to trip, you're supposed to mess up. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, those um, obstacles create revenue sources for certain industries, right? And so... Yes while people are experiencing a direct impact of this financial trauma, there are industries that are profiting off of that financial trauma. And so how do you go up against, you know, the system of capitalism? How do you go up against um, human nature? How do you go up against um, the way, what's happening internally, right? People who are um, navigating that guilt, that shame, that fear, um, who are isolating and saying, you know what, I messed up and maybe I don't deserve because this is what I'm being told by society. And so um, now as, you know, financial trauma is getting the rebrand that it's getting, I find it really interesting that, um, or rather, I find it really interesting the direction that it's going and that it's it's become kind of like this mainstream thing now and I'm curious what financial trauma is going to look like in the next, you know, five to 10 years, right? right? Because, you know, these things happen. Yeah. And um, my fear, if I'm going to just be very transparent, is that financial trauma and um, the related healing methodologies to financial trauma is going to become so commercialized and so um, non-individualistic mm -hmm. that we're not going to recognize it, that mm -hmm. it's going to become the new financial literacy catchphrase and we're not going to be as effective in our healing approaches. So mm -hmm. I think that the work that um, that I'm doing, the work that you're doing, the work that some other people I know in the space are doing is important because we're at kind of the cutting edge in defining what these healing methodologies look like, whether that be financial therapy, whether that be some form of uh, somatic healing, whether that be, um, you know, just kind of talk therapy and say, hey, like, you do deserve, you know, whatever, dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. And these are the ways to help kind of reframe your mindset or the communities that you can engage with so that you can kind of get the support that you need. Because we we are, uh, by nature, communal people, right? right? So we have to be around other people who are experiencing or um, who can affirm what it is that we're going through, um, lest we experience that kind of divide and conquer that you're you're addressing through your organization. So, I think that's really dope. Um, what about the other programs that Winning Ways is involved in? Tell yeah. me about um, what the evolution of that has looked like. Yeah, so we have two other programs. Um, actually, we have three other programs. The, fir the first one that hasn't launched yet, it's going to launch this year, is called Money Talk, which I, I'm going to invite you on camera now. I'm going to invite <laughs> you now. Um, and what that's going to be, that's going to be a forum where we do a QA. and a where We want to have an audience of the community and have a financial um, expert in their lane, whether that's someone with life insurance, someone with estate planning, home ownership, what have you. And then we'll have a Q&A, have people in the audience, and then create this space where, ask the expert, right? Um, 
so that's one of the programs that we're looking to launch this year. The second one is our flagship program, the one we started off with, financial literacy. And that that has always been something that we're gonna do. That's just just that's one of my passions. I'm a advocate for financial literacy and healing for financial trauma. Then we have the other two programs. One is called Spit and Paint, S P I T and Paint. And what we do with that is that is a DEI influence SEL social emotional learning curriculum where we fuse arts together. So what we do is we have um, uh, guided art instruction from an art teacher, a live DJ, as well as spoken word, which is the spit part. And the spoken word poetry is based off the whatever topic we were discussing or going over, whether that's current events, whether that's reentry, whether that's home ownership, whether that's uh, Black History Month, whatever it is, we have done different themes, and that theme is still surrounded by all these different genre of arts that we able to fuse together and give a, a, a safe space for people to express themselves. And that program has taken off. Uh, we've been able to do that throughout the state in different locations, such as uh, uh, halfway houses, rehabs, uh, elementary schools, churches. We've been really um, successful with that and really make an impact with that program. And then our other program is our a career readiness program. That's called uh, EYE, Elevate Your Employment. Again, going back to what we, what human services industry deems as success, we want to raise that bar when someone is homeless or experiencing the journey of coming home from incarceration or any of those traumas where they're picking themselves back up. A lot of times jobs or entry level jobs are are provided or referred to this person and the person takes a job, but the person hates the job. The person don't wanna stay there. And then they're unable to build savings, they're unable to take care of their family because sooner or later they're gonna quit. Sooner or later they're gonna, for whatever reason, not go in the next day because at the end of the day they dread it, right? Right. So what elevates your employment is we tap into the person. It's a case by case process where we create a career readiness. We use ONET uh, software to create this career readiness plan. And then whatever your pat, we, we ask you what your passions are. What are the things you like to do growing up as a kid? What are your hobbies? And then we take that information and we create a career plan with you to, to, to always encompass that person centered approach to then give you a plan that's of tangible steps that you can do to perform to become that entrepreneur or that masseuse or that um, store owner or whatever you want to do, right? Whatever career, CNA, it doesn't matter. But the, the focus on that one and why we're so adamant about the person-centered approach, because we believe that it'll be less people leaving jobs, less people um, losing jobs and more retention if you're doing something that you like to do. Right. So uh, that program started about a year ago. We did that, or we do that in a women's halfway house in uh, New Haven, and that's one we're going to also spread out throughout the state. And um, we we continue to think of innovative ways to implement program to supplement the community or the community. Uh, excuse me, the community organizations and the things they do to continue to be innovative, cutting edge, and have fun. Right, like uh, doing winning ways uh, has. I mean, it's a lot of work in terms of just administrative, logistics, grant writing, those things, which you, you have to do with a nonprofit. But in terms of doing the work, serving the community, that's always been a joy when we're wear, uh, when I'm wearing the Winning Ways hat or someone else is holding the Winning Ways banner. So um, at this point, you know, we've evolved into a, a agency. We started as a, you know, a small three uh, man team, but now we have a full board, we have um, full staff. And we're in New London now. Uh, we're funded in New London, Hartford, Waterbury, and New, and New Haven. And we're looking to, you know, continue to expand, get into Fairfield County. We're talking to um, certain organizations out there and continue just to do the work, to do the work. Yeah. Fantastic. I, um, I wish we had more time to dive deeper into this, but we do have to wrap up. So, Kevin, why don't you... Uh, let people know where they can find out more about winning ways mm -hmm. and um and yeah all right all right so you can find us at winningwaysct.org 
Also, you can find us on all social media platforms, Winning Ways Inc. or Winning Ways CT will pop up. Um, yellow and blue logo with Winning Ways on the bottom. And then um, also, we also have a podcast, the Falling Up Podcast. You can also find that on the winningwayct.org website. Fantastic. Kevin, thank you for uh, for coming on. I know we, we've been talking about it for a little while, and I'm, I'm glad that we were able to make that happen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another super impactful episode of Financially Irresponsible. I'm your host, Rock Kempster B. Until next time. Sometimes life just happens. Don't worry. Farmington Motorsports will get you back on the road and at a fair price. From towing to tires, emissions to transmissions. Our ASC certified techs do it all. Farmington Motorsports is a family-run business. We're in Napa Auto Center and AAA approved. We work on all makes and models from preventative maintenance to major repairs. And every repair is backed by our two-year, 24,000-mile nationwide warranty. When life happens to you, don't worry. Farmington Motorsports. Hi, I'm Jay McCormick, a board director at Nutmeg TV, your local public TV station right here in Farmington. Nutmeg TV has been an integral part of our community for over 30 years, providing a platform for residents to share stories, voice concerns, and celebrate achievements. It's a vital resource that connects us all, bringing countless local events to our TV screens. The topics are limitless and vary from being aware of scams to veterans helping veterans. Nutmeg TV continues to be here for the community. To continue this important work, we're asking for your support through a donation. Your contribution will ensure that Nutmeg TV remains a robust and relevant resource for our community. Thank you for supporting Nutmeg TV. Together, we can continue to amplify the voices and stories that make our community unique and vibrant. To make a donation, simply visit our website at nutmegtv.com or call the office at 860-321. 7405 for assistance.